So I'm excited to talk to you today about the um, SZ4D initiative. So this stands for Subduction Zones in 4D, that is space and time, understanding the processes that underlie subduction zone hazards in 4D. Um, this is a developing initiative uh, to NSF. It's an aspiring to be one of the next big things at NSF. Uh, there's a beautiful vision document that's the cover here, and I invite you to read it. I spent a good year of my life working on this, um, and it has some great ideas in it. And I'd like to talk to you today about how um, there are aspects of it that were definitely inspired by DCO, and I'd also uh, like to tell you about how you can get involved in SC4D and other uh, related initiatives. Right, so subduction is central to a lot of what we do here in this room. Um, it is the carbon recycler. Um, it takes input and processes it and turns it into output. Many people in this room work on different aspects of this, and in fact, uh, probably all the DCO communities work on something in this picture, from the deep biosphere in seafloor sediments, like we've heard about, um, and serpentinization, which leads to abiotic methane generation, to the high pressures and temperatures that transform carbon in the subduction zone that we've heard so much about, and the carbon outputs, which would be volcanic gases and diamonds. So I think we can all find our place in here in uh, this fantastic carbon factory. Now an interesting question uh, is how much goes in and how much goes out, and many people have worked on this problem too. This is our latest attempt to balance what goes in and out of, in this case, the entire mantle, um, not just subduction zones. And you can see we've drawn these balances, uh, these, the scale actually, as being balanced. Uh, that is, given the large uncertainties, it does appear that the inputs and outputs are, are, are balanced. And does this mean that the mantle is currently in steady state? Um, but the uncertainties are quite large, especially for some of the inputs you can see. Um, in blue are just the inputs and outputs to the subduction zone. Um, and this is something that uh, DCO has contributed a great amount to uh, over its decade. The altered ocean crust, for example, AOC, you can see those are two completely different estimates. They're pretty much similar. And we also heard this morning that uh, MORBs, you can see the mid-ocean ridge basalts, uh, those are also two completely different uh, estimates which are quite similar. DCO has also taught us that there's fluxes that we didn't even know about that were so large. For example, the uh, diffuse flux coming out of, whoops, intraplate. Oh, now I have to go back. <laughs> Backwards, please, thank you. Uh, the intraplate output that's a diffuse degassing of carbon. So um, we've learned a lot, but we still have a lot to understand. So this, the sediment fluxes in particular, you can see, could actually dominate the input, but the uncertainties are very large. Within the subduction zone itself, that is just balancing the blue input and blue output bars, you can see uh, it, there's definitely a, a excess on the input side, and that it, at least it appears, given these fluxes and uncertainties, that the recycling of carbon through the subduction zone is fairly uh, inefficient right now, although, albeit again, anywhere from 10 to 50 percent uh, recycling. Now, in the paper that, that Craig and I uh, did just put together, we really have a different view on this than just the global balances, and that is that uh, this, global, this global budget doesn't really apply anywhere, that the fluxes of carbon are so varied on the seafloor that they may have very different recycling efficiencies in each subduction zone. So, uh, for example, there's some subduction zones where we're only subducting mostly sedimentary organic carbon, like the Aleutians or where we're subducting mostly sedimentary carbonate, or places like Tonga where we're not subducting any sediments at all, essentially, and so we're just subducting carbon in the oceanic crust. And so we would argue that each of these regions is giving us an experiment that we could do. It's a natural laboratory to understand how these different forms of carbon recycle, and that's probably more relevant to uh, coming up with a global uh, recycling understanding. Uh, that's something about the inputs. Um, the outputs are spectacular and we can see them. The volcanic gas community at DCO has done such an amazing job in both measuring and discovering new things about the carbon that comes out volcanoes. This is a movie put together by DCO. The background is actually a real-time, it's gonna come around again, it's a real-time image of uh, Torrealba volcano degassing in Costa Rica. Um, and then the data are plotted on top. This is actually over several years 
and you can see the CO2 sulfur bounces around and then it spikes and then the volcano erupts and then it drops back down and bounces down and it spikes and the volcano erupts. And this happens a few weeks before the eruption. As Marie Edmonds told us this morning, it's a new volcanic precursor. We knew something about this before DCO, but it was Eric Howery's foresight to fund decade that has put 10 or 20 of these multi-gas boxes around volcanoes in the world. So we now have this time series data that's showing us completely new phenomena that happened before volcanoes erupt. So it's totally cool, but what's causing it? Is it deep gas that's more carbon rich? Is it sulfur getting scrubbed? What's happening? So we still have a lot to, to learn about this phenomenon. And I'll tell you, this, this, this scientific discovery is something that actually did drive this, SCD for, uh, this SC4D initiative in part. It was 2016 when Tobias Fischer and uh, Marie Edmonds had both come to the subduction zone observatory meeting, which led to this initiative. And they gave this jaw-dropping talk about these data. And it really inspired the community to focus on a subduction initiative that had at its heart understanding geohazards. And this is something quite different than the initiatives at NSF that had come before. It's the science behind the hazards, the fundamental physics and chemistry behind tsunamis and earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and landslides, with a specific goal to understand, uh, to increase our pr predictive understanding, but that what we're trying to do is, is understand the fundamental physics and chemistry, like what's driving that CO2 sulfur ratio to rise, in real time and through geological time. So that's kind of the mission statement for the SC4D initiative. Um, it's focusing on three different frontier uh, areas that are inspiring it. One is the volcano observatories I just talked about. The other is actually seafloor geodesy to see what happens actually uh, before earthquakes happen. And the other is uh, to connect landslides to faults, accretionary prisms, and melange. So these are all kind of work that's being done at the bleeding edge. And again, DCO informed a lot of this, of this project. Uh, the implementation concepts are still to be discovered and defined by the community. They range from anything from kind of a global attack, uh, looking at either seismic gaps or uh, or actually all the volcanic global emitters. So on that map, everything that's red is a volcano that's actively emitting SO2 measured from space, or it's actively deforming. These are the active volcanoes where we could actually measure something. There's only 80 of them. It's finite. Maybe in a decadal plan, we could instrument all these volcanoes with arrays. On the other hand, people are arguing for an arc scale process. Let's look at South America or Central America and really look at an entire system, how it varies along strike. And then there's other proposals to use a rapid response uh, attack that let's wait for the events to happen and then study them uh, as they recover. Uh, I think you can see in all of those that there's a clear future in the DCO gas community. I think you understand that I'm one of the greatest groupies of the volcanic gas community. I think they are an amazing bunch of people and they've really come together under DCO and there's a lot of early career people and there's a lot to discover. So we've seen within DCO uh, of, of putting mass spectrometers inside Land Rovers and driving up to the volcano to measure carbon isotopes in the field and then Emma Liu and Kieran Wood are developing something they're calling a dinosaur egg, which is an instrument that's deployed by drone into volcanic craters that would be otherwise too dangerous to approach. They call it a dinosaur egg because uh, it, it hatches in, after, long, after uh, being deployed and then starts transmitting uh, data uh, through telemetry until the instrument uh, dies. Uh, also, there's a legacy of DCO in um, the decade project that put together a fantastic database in uh, cooperation with the Smithsonian and with the USGS. There's now a page you can go to for any volcano that not, has not just gas data, but the samples. And this is a tremendous uh, legacy from DCO that SC4D would benefit from. Okay, say no more. I think there's a place for sulfur in, in any new study. Um, Sulfur it clearly moves with carbon, um, but and we know a lot about it. We can see it degassing from space, but there's a lot that we don't know. We don't know how much subducts. We don't know what the species are. We don't know what, how sulfur is, is controlled by or controls the redox, and we really don't know much about the degassing process. So water and hydrogen and carbon and sulfur clearly are all important in this process, but I think sulfur's got uh, some game. 
All right, so SC4D is just one of many things that are happening right now. Um, SC4D is currently an RCN, which is a research coordination network funded by NSF, to crystallize the program in the next few years. There's two other RCNs. One is uh, the Modeling Collaboratory for Subduction that's led by Torsten Becker. And as the name suggests, it's looking at modeling, both dynamics and fluid and melt kind of modeling. There's another RCN called Converse that Tobias Fischer is leading. This stands for Community Network on Volcanic Eruption Response, something like that. Does that get that? And so that's uh, bringing the scientific community along with the uh, agencies in order to, have to, to form a coherent response. So we have science that's done after a volcano erupts. Um, right here in the National Academies was born the Erupt Report. And this is a, a, a report that's really set over the, path, over the next few years um, the, the uh, blueprint for how we do volcano science, and it's informed a lot of these. Uh, there's community volcano experiments that are being proposed to NSF. The new National Volcano Early Warning System has actually now been uh, ratified into law, although it's not been appropriated yet. This is to uh, instrument 169 volcanoes in the US. Um, we are working on a project uh, called AVERT, anticipating volcanic eruptions in real time. This is putting arrays in two volcanoes in Alaska as proof of concept for open satellite telemetered community volcano experiments. Diana Roman is hoping to uh, roll this out around the world, and you can talk to both of us at her poster. Um, just to show you that there is some real money that's attached to these, NSF has already spent a million in planning and five million for the new seafloor geodesy. The USGS, if it gets appropriated, is getting $55 million. And then uh, this project is within review uh, in the approval process at the Moore Foundation. Okay, so my final slide is how you would get involved. Um, there's an SC4D webpage sc4d.org, please join the mailing list. There are working groups that are attached to sc4d. One is the magmatic drivers of eruption. Please uh, join that working group if you're interested in, in volcanoes and how CO2 cycles and how it leads to eruption. We're gonna have an AGU town hall and look out for workshops next year. Tobias, how many workshops did you have this year? Uh, four. four, so there's gonna be more next year and hope to see you guide this program as it develops. Um, because I believe these multidisciplinary programs are really where our discoveries come from and that DCO has done this so patently well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, question here. Hi. So hey, Peter. Terry and I never talk. This is talk. my colleague, yes. We, yeah, we never talk, so we have to do it here. So. Uh, could you go back to your subduction fluxes slide? I can't go back. These guys could? I don't know. That might be hard for them. Um, well, me, these are the bars on the balance, the one or the map? Well, let me just clarify something, and then we can talk about S4D in the same context. So first of all, um, people have been asking me, so why is this so different from Kellerman and Manning's carbon balance for subduction zones? And of course, it isn't. Your estimate is well within the uncertainties of the we, you know, uncertainties that we emphasize. But secondly, I guess you haven't chosen to include input into the lithosphere, which we estimated was somewhere between zero and 47 in the units on this slide. And so if you put 47 on top of the blue output bar, you would find that more carbon is coming out of arcs than is going in, which of course isn't right. But it, it just emphasizes that we really don't know and that your paper did not include those reservoirs and fluxes. So now let's talk about subduction 4D. <laughs> Thank subduction you, Peter. Everyone read Kellerman and Manning, right. We were trying to update DCO's most recent inputs and outputs. I that wasn't was, and trying it wasn't to the point advertise of the paper. our paper. I was <laughs> responding to the implication that our paper was wrong. Now, let me so move no forward right to the, my so question. So, can we keep <laughs> are the rest crystalline of this rocks, very brief, Are crystalline rocks please. and fluxes involving crystalline rocks going to play any role in subduction 4D? Because the margins initiative and the geoprisms initiative, which you very ably led, w involved a lot of work on those rocks, and the results were very important. And I'm just wondering where that community fits in the context of subduction 4D. Um, I hope there's a place for that community, but Subduction Zone 4D is a different project. It's really about geohazards, and it's really focused on 
uh, how volcanoes uh, prepare to erupt, but also there's a, there's a geological time aspect to this, and so understanding the, the volcanic record through the whole lifetime of an arc system would require understanding uh, crystalline rocks. Okay, thank you thank very you. much. And no. one last oh, question. Yes. Hey, yes, Carrie, a great talk. So I have a question about this, uh, the force D, the time uh, D. So h what is the scale when you go back into the past or the present? What's, what range of time are you thinking about? And also, what's the time resolution? When you try to predict the uh, eruption from the sulfur to carbon ratio, how far in advance can you uh, do the prediction? Right, well, the several volcanoes that have shown this phenomenon show it occurring a few weeks before the eruption, so it's actually a useful time frame. But I guess the 4D is some things actually happen minutes before an eruption, or seconds, and so looking at water diffusion and crystals can tell us things that are happening minutes to seconds. Um, in terms of the geological time, it's probably not the Archean, so again, we're focusing on systems that are hazardous today, and what's relevant would be, say, you know, maybe a 50 or 100 million year time scale for a given arc system and how the volcanoes have evolved. So that's kind okay, of the perspective. You. Okay, thank you very yes. much.